going to try and share. Yeah, I was just thinking about watching those graphics. How, um, on the one hand, our graphics keep getting cooler and cooler and more and more cutting edge. And on the other hand, we have less and less fish in the oceans and less and less biodiversity. Uh, and hotter and hotter climate, more and more polluted environment. So clearly something is off track with our contemporary use of creativity. We're going to think about the future of creativity. We probably have to start thinking about how we uh, reappropriate, uh, transform our creativity so that it supports um, our future sustainable existence on this earth. Uh, to go back from my uh, path and trajectory a little bit, uh, I was a journalist. I grew up in New York City in Manhattan. Uh, my parents were artists and uh, editors. Um, my mother had actually been involved with the famous literary movement in the 1950s called the Beat Generation. Uh, she'd been involved with uh, the writer Jack Kerouac, who wrote On the Road. I don't know if that book's as popular in Mexico uh, as it is in America. Um, then she was a book editor, my father was a painter. Uh, I was a journalist in my 20s in New York, and I was writing for the New York Times Magazine, Esquire, Rolling Stone, and so on. Uh, writing about the ecological crisis in particular, uh, and then just my other experiences as being sort of part of like the literary artistic culture of New York, I began to have kind of a, a spiritual crisis, uh, an existential crisis, uh, where I began to really think about the fact that underlying uh, the, the acceleration, the kind of euphoric, hysteric acceleration of all of our cultural phenomena, um, there was kind of an underlying uh, tragic nihilism uh, that our culture had, had, you know, the culture that I grew up in particularly had forfeited uh, the, the religious beliefs of the past, and I think obviously that was a necessary process. Um, so, for instance, my parents had, you know, my, my dad had been Christian, Catholic, my mother had been Jewish, so they, they had, uh, you know, given up those, those past beliefs and had accepted the worldview of secular materialism, of scientific rationalism, uh, which essentially, uh, you know, is based on the idea that uh, consciousness itself, uh, you know, is only brain-based. It's kind of an epiphenomenon of matter, um, that we're simply in a process of uh, physical evolution based on this, you know, accidental conjunction of gases and, and whirlpools of energies that have pulled this solar system into manifestation. Uh, so, um, when I was in my late 20s and I went through this uh, spiritual crisis, um, you know, and, and it, as I said, it had come from working on stories about the ecological crisis, about um, what was happening to um, French. I wrote a piece for Esquire magazine about the decline of the sperm count, uh, which they liked because it kind of fit, fitted their kind of you know, humor around male sexuality and so on. Uh, but it turns out that all around the world, the sperm count has declined drastically over the last 50 years. Uh, along with the increase in you know, uh, cancers of the reproductive system, breast cancers, and so on. And when you start to trace that back, you discover that it has to do with the plastics and the endocrine disrupt disrupting chemicals, you know, chlorinated pl pesticides, and so on, that are concentrating throughout the food chain. So it's just one aspect of this much larger um, you know, ecological crisis that, that we're uh, creating on the earth right now. But I, I, when, I, when, when my piece came out, a few other pieces on that subject came out, I just saw how Enable, in, enable or incapable people were, were to reacting to um, this kind of ecological scenario, uh, I, I began to realize that something really deep was wrong uh, in, in what we were doing, and I began to realize that the basis of it was this, was, was this inherent uh, nihilism. And I began to ask myself, okay, so I'd grown up in the scientific worldview, it's what my parents had accepted, it's what uh, my teachers had, you know, it, it told me was the case. You know, it's what the books, most of the books I read insisted upon, but did I really know that it was the case, that I really know that consciousness was only um, an epiphenomenon of, of, of brain function? Did I, did I know, you know, how, how could I, from my own subjective, phenomenological perspective, uh, ask this, you know, sort of answer for myself the question of was there a soul? Was there a spirit? Was there an existence of anything larger than just a uh, you know, physical body uh, you know, that would end in a, in a you know, kind of permanent uh, extinction? You know? um, so when I reviewed my life up to that point, I remembered psychedelic experiences from college. 
And those drugs had been, you know, highly, uh, you know, kind of suppressed and ridiculed since the 1960s, uh, when they were associated with these larger uh, cultural and countercultural and, and, and even social movements. Uh, they've been demonized, they've been made illegal, and so on. So at that point in my late 20s, I, I began as a, and I was a journalist, so I began to read a lot about shamanism, the use of uh, visionary plants and substances in tribal cultures around the world, and then I was able to get assignments to go and visit some of these cultures. Uh, for instance, I came to Mexico, I went to Oaxaca, to Matla de Jimenez, where, uh, I'm sure I just terribly mispronounced that, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I apologize. Uh, but anyway, I visited the town where the magic mushrooms had been rediscovered, psilocybin had been rediscovered in the late 50s, or mid 50s. Uh, I also went to West Africa and went through tribal initiation uh, in, in, in Gabon uh, with a tribe there called the Bwiti uh, using a substance called uh, Iboga, uh, which is actually now known in the West as Ibogaine, where it's a uh, treatment for, um, it's becoming more and more popular as an underground treatment for addictions, particularly heroin addiction. Uh, I also visited a tribe in Ecuador um, called the Sequoia, uh, people there who have an ancient tradition of using a plant medicine called ayahuasca. Uh, out of curiosity, how many people here have heard of ayahuasca? Um, so ayahuasca is a sacred medicine of the Amazon basin. It's used by tribal people from Brazil through Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and it's uh, two plants that have to be brewed together for a very, very long time, and they produce a unique um, visionary experience uh, that, you, that you often have, uh, you almost invariably have in a ceremony uh, led by shamans who make music, and the music is like a guiding instrument, the, the chanting and so on that they believe really can lead you through these visionary realms and even induce, uh, you know, kind of uh, experiences of healing, uh, of uh, deep uh, awakening and so on. So I had a number of these experiences, and I ended up writing a book, my first book, uh, Breaking Open the Head, uh, which was uh, really ended up being a personal account of my a shift in worldview from secular uh, scientific materialism to uh, recognizing that there were these other dimensions of the psyche, and that the realms that shamans talk about are just as valid as the realms that uh, scientists talk about. Uh, and for me, this was uh, you know, quite a traumatic uh, and amazing revelation. Um, and as I said, I really began as a skeptic and had to like field test and probe. And the, the book really provides the, the evidence for that shift in, in my perspective. That, that included many experiences of you know telepathy, synchronicity, uh, psychic phenomena, uh, and so on. And then correlating that with the evidence I received when I interviewed many people, talked to many shamans and practitioners. And then also uh, reading literature ranging from you know Carl Jung to Rudolf Steiner to many of the, the, the greatest uh, visionary thinkers who, who have tried tried to create kind of a, a, a ladder or a template for the skeptical modern mind to uh, reaccess these lost dimensions of the psyche. Uh, so as I finished uh, breaking up in the head, uh, I became more and more cognizant that if our uh, modern society in its drive towards a scientific knowledge and materialism had rejected or forfeited these lost dimensions of the psyche, uh, and that these were actually valid uh, dimensions of our being, uh, perhaps crucially important ones, it meant that our society was, from my perspective, in a good deal of trouble. Uh, because we had neglected, it's kind of like we're dealing with half a deck, you know, we, we, we've accepted one aspect of the world, but we've neg 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 neglected or negated its underside, its, its other, the other dimensions of, 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 of our reality. And then I began to look at indigenous cultures around the world and realize that many of them had a knowledge system about this time, uh, particularly uh, tribes like the Hopi in Arizona or the classical Mayan civilization uh, in the Yucatan, uh, who seem to have spent an inordinate, inordinate amount of their uh, cultural creativity and energy to understand uh, the nature of these very large cycles of, of time uh, and to construct kind of uh, instruments or measuring devices uh, where they, um, wow, really? It's rats. I'm not even at like point one of what I wanted to say. Um, oh well. Okay, so, so, um, so anyway, so I wrote a book called 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl, uh, where I basically ended up believing that, uh, arguing 
uh, that um, there was a validity to, the, to these ancient understandings of, of, this, uh, of this being a time of transformation, a time of planetary awakening and integration. And um, so, so for me, I never anticipated 2012 to be a threshold of anything necessarily destructive, although I think we can see if we look at these, these massive events that are happening around the world, like uh, Fukushima uh, or the oil spill in, in, in the Gulf, uh, the negative side, uh, on the positive side, the uh, evolution of our communications technologies, which has essentially meshed human society into one uh, planetary mind, uh, the beginning of what uh, thinkers like uh, Talhard de Chardin talked about as a new sphere. Uh, you know, if you think about um, uh, the Earth having a just a physical you know, environment uh, of life, that being the biosphere, uh, then you could also think of the Earth having a, uh, a thinking envelope around it, which we could conceive of as a, a newosphere, the Greek word nous, that means light. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so, so essentially, um, with 2012, I felt that uh, we we're, were beginning, we're in this process of this awakening of the planetary mind, and potentially an evolution of human consciousness and human society to its next level or, or dimension of being. Uh, and from my perspective, that, that's the process we're going to see uh, un, 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 you know, taking place, that transformation you know, has already begun and will continue to uh, evolve, open, unfold over the next you know, 5, 10, 20 years. You know, I, I can't put a particular time limit on it as it's, as, as it's a process. You know? And for me, aspects of that process include the uh, integration of uh, Western uh, science and uh, Eastern metaphysics, uh, mystical traditions, indigenous shamanism, and I could discuss many, many ways in which these things are now coming together um, that I think you would be fascinated to know about. I mean, one example, for instance, well, there's research being done on you know, meditative uh, states of Tibetan monks uh, by, by brain scientists, and really I'm teaching them a lot about uh, brain plasticity, uh, and then there's a lot of tremendous research now going on on psychedelics, uh, which is one of my areas of interest. Uh, there's a group called uh, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, maps.org, who've been sponsoring research around the world on the, on the value of psychedelics for uh, healing. Uh, so for instance, they're doing studies in the U.S. using um, MDMA, more commonly known as the street drug ecstasy, as a, as a treatment tool uh, in therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, uh, particularly with uh, veterans uh, returning from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And they're finding that MDMA has about an 80% uh, success rate when used in therapy uh, uh, compared to the other, other treatments which have very low success rate. This is even with treatment of uh, sufferers from PTSD. So in any, in, in any case, I could, I could offer many more examples, but I only have an extremely limited amount of time apparently, uh, as to how the uh, you know, um, aspects of our psyche are now becoming available for our you know, scientific and rational culture uh, to explore, and there's a kind of merging taking place of science and, and, and spirituality, which I think is really crucial. It suddenly got very dark in this audience. I guess we have like, um, does that mean I'm supposed to leave, or is that just like, uh, just the way it is, I guess, right now? Okay, uh, we got some darkness, so that was pretty good. Uh, anyway, so um, let's go from darkness into the light. And the one end, we have this, um, you know, we have a, a massive ecological crisis that actually threatens human survival in the near term. Uh, for whatever reason, our, our, we've inherited the inertia of uh, you know, corporate, capitalist, social, you know, military, industrial, entertainment, mega machine. Uh, and, then, and this thing that we're kind of enmeshed in uh, is uh, unfortunately having the impact of uh, decimating our, our future existence on this planet. You know, so wh whatever creativity is in our near-term reality, it has to shift from you know, my gadget, uh, you know, my little company, you know, my little design project, you know, whatever it is we think we're doing, to somehow recognizing that we're actually uh, integral aspects of this planetary ecology. Um, and actually, I think that you could really look at, uh, you know, humanity and the Earth constituting as a, uh, you know, a kind of planetary superorganism. Uh, and that's part of what we're reaching the realization, uh, the, the type of realization that we're now reaching. Is, is that uh, yeah? That we're either going to make it all as one unified being, or we're not going to make it at all. 
And uh, one of the main uh, influences on my recent thought has been the uh, design scientist uh, Buckminster Fuller. How many people here have read him or checked him out? Cool. Yeah, I think that you know his his way of thinking, his approach uh, is so crucial um, and and really still deserves to be sort of much more common knowledge. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Utopia or Oblivion in the '60s, and another book called Operation Spaceship Earth. Uh, and so his perspective is that uh, was that you know essentially if you looked at our the acceleration of our capacity for creativity for you know innovation technology you know technical development and at the same time as you, if you also looked at our you know increasing capacity for destruction and so on uh, I, our, our two our two endpoints uh, of our social evolution were either going to be comparatively utopia or oblivion you know I, either humanity would mesh itself together. And uh, use our resources, um, you know, hyper efficiently to guarantee everybody um, at least, at the very least, a decent, decent way of life. And you know, with the global communication infrastructure we've created, you know, we could liberate the knowledge and creative commons so that everybody has access, free access to, to all the knowledge that humanity has uh, attained up to this point. Um, and uh, you know, recreate local communities as uh, you know, self-sufficient living laboratories uh, where food is grown locally rather than transported great distances, where sustainable regenerative technologies for restoring the uh, environment are used and so on. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the absolute fact is that some type of major um, kind of rapid mutation of, of, of global consciousness is going to be necessary. If you simply look at the uh, trajectory that we're now on, uh, and for instance, uh, they talk about uh, a necessity for you know a, a rapid reduction in, in carbon emissions, you know, and clearly you know that that if we don't, and at the moment we're on uh, you know we're on course for a four four degrees uh, temperature rise by 2050, and a six to eight degree temperature rise by the end of the, the end you know, 2100. So you know. Maybe it takes people who come from, you know, the, the, the psychedelic counterculture, you know, edge realm intellectual fringe to just point out that, um, you know, whatever whatever the construct we, we think we're in now, uh, you know, is going to is going to have to make a, a major uh, course correction, and we can't pretend that it's anybody else who's going to do that. I mean, that's I think we're always looking for authorities or outsiders. It's actually going to have to become. Uh, you know something that that, that comes from the, the, the you know the, the individual and the collective human soul. You know the, the realization that, that this transformation is not only necessary but actually is very much within our grasp, within our power to, to, to bring about. Uh, and one way, for instance, that we could look at doing that would be uh, use of social technologies or social media. So I, I can't see Mitzi anymore. So if I have to stop talking, she should just uh, do I have to stop. What's that? Was that? Five more minutes. Five more minutes, okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so, uh, so for instance, we see that Facebook within, within under 10 years has reached a, you know, has a billion people uh, you know, involved with it. We see also, we look at the Arab Spring of 2011, that these were uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, civil society movements, uh, revolutionary transformative movements that were kind of um, brought into manifestation by social media, social technology, by, by these tools, communication tools like Twitter and Facebook. But we also see that um, you know these tools are, are limited. You know they allow for forms of communication, you know forms of uh, coordination, but they're not really devised to um, construct what we probably will, will ultimately need is some type of more uh, you know direct democratic infrastructure, so that uh, we shift from a society based on competition and domination to one that's based on cooperation and symbiosis. Uh, this idea, by the way, that humanity is uh, on, the, on the cusp of, of awakening and self-realizing itself to be one planetary superorganism is one that actually uh, meshes well with current and, and recent understandings in, in uh, you know, biology and evolution. Uh, what, what, what biologists and evolutionists have, have more and more un understood or discovered is um, a, a great book on this, by the way, is a book called Spontaneous Evolution. Uh, combination uh, of a cell biologist and political philosopher, Steve, Steve Berman and Slimpton, is that if you look at previous epochs of evolution, it's like competition, aggression, uh, are, are the hallmarks of immature ecosystems. When ecosystems reach a point of uh, sophistication and maturity, they move into, into uh, cooperation and symbiosis. And we all have a tremendous example of this process in our own bodies. 
Our bodies are, you know, trillions of uh, cells and microorganisms that uh, we can imagine in the previous uh, phase of, of, of uh, evolution where we're, you know, competing, fighting the environment, and somehow through some process uh, managed to figure out that they could work together to construct more complex structures, such as uh, bones and, and eyeballs and, and, you know, organs and so on. And, um, you know, if we think about it in those terms, I really think we can begin to think, like, how much humanity as a collective is like is like a super organism. I mean, you know, can think, think about something like the building of a satellite dish or a radar dish, you know, is pretty much similar to, you know, the construction of an eye by cells and microorganisms. You know, I mean, all, all around us we're enmeshed in these uh, invisible webs of, of coordination, you know, and, and symbiosis. Uh, and, but we still have a uh, corrupt uh, political and financial uh, structure that is uh, not allowing for human creativity uh, to be uh, unleashed properly to solve the problems that now face us. Uh, all right, guys, maybe I'll stop there. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Yeah? Did I speak too fast? No. no? It's okay. All right, so I'm around all weekend and beyond, so if you got inspired or have anything you want to say, just come and chat. And um, it was really, really nice to talk to you and uh, enjoy your, your bonus. And I hope I didn't bring you down. Uh, I, the thing that I want to say ultimately is I think that humanity can make this shift. And I mean, it's just like, you know, that's why I wish I had like three or four hours to discuss and, and really go into it. I mean, you know, there's a lot of mythologies that, that, that you know, we've got sub-programs of cultural mythologies which are now kind of holding us back from our unfolding. For instance, you know, overpopulation, you know, yes, you know, to a certain extent. But on the other hand, you know, you can take the entire population of humanity and they could fit into an area the size of Texas with a little garden. You know, so it's really not population at this point that's the problem. It's uh, corruption and it's a uh, massively inefficient use of resources. And uh, really, somehow that that Buckminster Fuller design science approach has to, you know, permeate a larger a swath of our of our you know elite's consciousness and then be applied systemically. And and I do feel that um, you know as edgy or, or odd as it may sound, you know, aspects of, the, of a psychedelic renaissance uh, are helpful for this, you know, particularly the use of ayahuasca, the rainforest medicine, which um, I think really gives people a sudden insight into their uh, intrinsic relationship to the uh, natural world. You know, and for uh, indigenous people, uh, you know, there really wasn't a, a kind of a dualistic split between spirit and matter or, or nature and, and, and supernatural. Um, you know, so those are things that our culture has imposed, and as, as we, we reach our next level of conscious um, evolution, uh, we can uh, unfold back into a uh, integral uh, worldview. Uh, anyway, I hope hope that uh, enticed you in some fashion. <laughs> <laughs>